So we're going to be going through this blockchain demo on this site right here. Now, the creator of the site has a fantastic video and a fantastic walkthrough blockchain 101. It is right on their site. So if you're looking for another explanation, definitely check out his video. It is absolutely fantastic. But the first thing that we really need to do in order to understand blockchain, in order to understand really anything and everything that's going on here, we first really need to understand this SHA-256 hash or hashing just kind of in general. Let's first understand what a hash is. A hash is a unique fixed length string meant to identify any piece of data. They are created by putting some piece of data into a hash function. In this example, uh, the hashing algorithm used is SHA-256. Now, Ethereum actually uses uh, this, uh, this right here for its hashing algorithm, which isn't quite um, SHA-256, but is in kind of this SHA family. But it's, it's really just another way to hash things. And uh, the specific hash algorithm doesn't matter uh, so much. So uh, this example uses SHA-256, but you can imagine it's the same as the Ethereum hash. They're just going to you know, result in a different hash. So what's going to happen in this application here is whatever data or whatever information we put into this data section here, as you can see below, this hash changes. So what's happening is this data is running through the SHA-256 hash algorithm and it's outputting this unique hash. So this hash is a unique fixed length string that's going to identify like a blank data piece here, right? So if I put in, you know, my name, like, you know, Patrick Collins, this is the hash that's going to represent Patrick Collins, right? And you can see, even when I put, you know, tons and tons of data in here, the length of the string doesn't change, right? So it's always going to be the same amount, we can put almost any amount of data in here, there is an upper limit on the max size of the data. But for all intents and purposes, we can pretty much put any length in here. And you'll see too that, you know, every time I type in Patrick Collins, this hash is always going to be this 7E5B, right? I'm going to delete it. I'm going to do Patrick Collins again, you know, 7E5B. It's always this, this unique hash is always going to be unique, right? It's always going to be this fixed length string here. So now we can take this idea, right, of putting this data in here, and we can move on to uh, this concept of a block. So with this block concept, we're going to take the exact same thing with this hash, this, this data section, right? But instead of having everything just being this, this singular data area right here, we're going to split this data up into block, nonce, and data. So all so what we're going to do is we're actually going to hash all three of these to get to get this hash, right? We're going to put all three of these, we're going to say all three of these are combined uh, together, we're going to put every all three of them into this hashing algorithm uh, to figure it out. So if I type a bunch of stuff here, we can see that block one with nonce, you know, this nonce and this data, we're going to get this hash. And as you can see, actually, the screen turns red, this block turned red. Now, what happens when I hit this mind button? When I hit this mind button, it's actually gonna take some time, it's gonna think for a little bit. And we can see that the nonce here actually changed, right? The nonce is different from what it was before. And this hash now starts with four zeros. Okay, and then it, it the, the back turned green. When we're, when we're talking about mining, we're talking about miners solving some type of very difficult problem that takes a lot of time to do. Now, in this example here, the problem that uh, the miners had to solve was they had to find a nonce or, or a value in this nonce section that when hashed with at block number one with this data, it would start with four zeros. So the problem here the miners had to solve was to start with four zeros. And the only way for them to really do that is kind of this brute force, you know, trying stuff. So they tried one, okay, one didn't work. Okay, two, nope, two didn't work. Three, nope, four, five, six, okay, five, well, that started with one zero, but that's not four. And they have to keep trying all these numbers until they uh, get to this one where, you know, let's hit mine again, where it has four zeros at the top at the start. Now, this specific problem changes blockchain to blockchain, right? Uh, Ethereum has a, a different problem for miners to solve. Um, Bitcoin has different problems for miners to solve, but this concept is going to be the same. And since Ethereum is proof of stake now, nodes actually take turns solving these problems. Again, we're not going to go too deep into that right now, though. So they have to take it, it, um, one block is going to be this, this, uh, this concept is going to be all this data, it's going to be the block number, and it's going to be this nonce, right? And so this nonce is the solution um, is, is going to be the, the number that they use to get like the solution to the problem, right? So if I go to one here, you know, and I do this again, 
I'm going to hit mine. And the nonce has changed, right? It went from 1 to 33,128 because this is the nonce that allowed this hash to start with four zeros. And so that's what's happening when uh, blockchain miners are mining. They're going through this process, this very computationally intensive process of trying to find a nonce that fulfills whatever the problem is. So that's really it, actually. So that's a block. And, and that's really what's happening when miners are mining. They're just looking. There's trial and error, brute force, trying to find this nonce. So, so now that we know what a block is, let's go to the next step and figure out, okay, well, what's a block chain? So here we have an example of what a block chain is going to look like, right? We have a combination, you know, we have back here in the block section, we have one, what one block looks like. Now here we have multiple different blocks, right? Each one of these represents a different block, but we have an additional column here, or we have additional uh, variable here. So like before, you know, we have block, nonce, and data, right? We have block, nonce, data, but we also have this thing called previous, right? And so this is actually going to be pointing to the previous hash of the last block. So for example, if we go to the, the last block in this blockchain, it says previous is 0008E8. And if we look at the hash of block number four, it's 0000AE8. And then we look at its previous, it's uh, four zeros B9, we have four zeros B9, and so on, all the way back to our first block, which has previous of just all zeros, right? And so the block with the previous of all zeros is going to be known as the Genesis block. So you've probably heard that before, the Genesis block. It's the first block in the blockchain where the previous hash points to a hash that uh, doesn't actually exist. Now, as you can imagine, kind of the same as how this block worked, how the block, nonce, and data all go through the hashing algorithm. In the blockchain, the block, nonce, data, and previous hash all go through this hashing algorithm to figure out, you know, what the hash is, okay? So if we go to over here, you know, for example, if I type in, you know, Patrick, obviously this is now no longer valid, right? Because this nonce uh, combined with the block, the data, and the previous hash aren't going to solve, you know, our problem of having four zeros at the, at the start, right? So I'm going to go ahead and fix that. And, and that's that's kind of an easy way to, to see it being broken. But, but let's take a look. If I break this block right here, what happens if I if I break the data in here? If I do like Patrick in here, you can see that both of these are now red. Both of these are now invalid, right? Because the block hashed with the nonce, hashed with the new data, which is my name, Patrick, hashed with the, pre hashed with the previous block, is now a brand new hash, right? And this block is still pointing to this previous hash right here, right? Is pointing to this previous block, and now it is wrong and it is messed up, and now um, and now its nonce with this previous hash is also wrong, right? And this is where when we talk about uh, blockchains being immutable, this is exactly how it's immutable, right? Because if I go back and I change anything, you know, if I just typed A right here. The entire blockchain is now invalidated because none of these are going to have uh, nonces that solve this equation anymore. So this is why blockchains are immutable is because anytime you change one thing, you ruin the rest of the blockchain. OK, so however, though, you know, if if an A was here originally, we can go ahead and mine these. We can mine all these. But as you can see, you know, this is going to start getting very uh, computationally expensive because I have to go redo uh, basically the entire blockchain. Uh, and the farther and farther down the line you get, the harder and harder it becomes to, you know, rehash and, and redo all these different blockchains here. Now, this makes a lot of sense, right? So we have this blockchain. It's really hard to change something in the past. But if we do, we can just go ahead and remine it. Now, if I'm the one who controls the blockchain, right, if I'm the one who controls this, you know, and, and I want to change something in the past, well, okay, great. All I got to do is change this data here and then, you know, mine each one of these. You know, obviously, it's going to be very computationally expensive, but it's something that I can do, right, if I'm the one who owns the blockchain. Now, here's where the decentralized nature or the distributed nature really uh, makes it incredibly powerful. So we're going to go to the distributed tab here, which uh, I also refer to as the decentralized tab here. Uh, and it's going to show us what a blockchain looks like uh, in a decentralized manner. So we have this exact same uh, initial setup here. We have distributed blockchain. We have you know the, our first blockchain, which is kind of exactly as the one from here. But we also have more than one. So we have peer A, peer B and peer C. And when people are talking about peer to peer, peer to peer transactions, they're really talking, uh, this is kind of that concept that they're talking about, right? So we have a number of different peers who are running this blockchain technology, they're all weighted equally, right? Each one of these peers, or each one of these nodes, each one of these entities 
running a blockchain has the exact same power as anybody else, right? So the way that we can tell very easily which blockchain is correct or which ones are correct are by looking at this end hash here, right? Or by looking at where we are uh, in the blockchain. Because again, remember, because again, remember this this hash that this this in this last block here is going to encompass all of the blocks from before, right? Because this last hash is going to have the previous hash here, which includes the previous hash here, which this hash includes the previous hash here, and which so this last hash is encompasses everything in here, right? And we can look, we can look at the hash of peer C, which is four zeros and then E four B. We can look at the latest hash of peer B, which is four zeros E four B, and then peer A, which is four zeros E four B. So all of these peers, all of these nodes, all of these decentralized, you know, these independent, um, all these independent users running this blockchain software, they're all matched up. It's very easy for their nodes to look at each other and say, hey, great, we are all matched up. Now, what, let's say that A decides that, you know, something happened on the blockchain that they didn't like, and they wanted to go back and change something, right? So let's say they change here, you know, obviously, uh, the rest of their blockchain is invalidated, and they have to spend a lot of computational power to catch up to speed. So let's go ahead and humor it. Let's say that they they did, they ended up catching up. Uh, they ended up catching up, you know, they ended up mining everything. And now they have a valid blockchain, right? It solves the equation. Awesome. However, in block number three, there's something new, right? This is here, and it shouldn't have been here. This is something that peer A put in by themselves. All that happens now is we look at all the blockchains that are running the software, and we're looking at all the hashes at hash at block number five. So peer A has this new hash now, 0009BC, but peer B has a different hash, 000E4B, right? So who's right? Is it is it peer A with their new stuff, or is it peer B? Well, that's where the decentralized error comes in, because then we can look at peer C, and peer C also has E4B. So peer B and peer C both say, hey, peer A, you're wrong, get out, right? And peer A will stop being able to participate in the mining rewards because they have essentially forked uh, the blockchain and started their own little blockchain, right, with their own history, because they're the only ones with this, this piece of data in block three, whereas peer B and peer C have nothing in there. So that really shows why uh, in these blockchain worlds, in this decentralized world, there really is no centralized entity. You know, peer A, you know, might have been maliciously motivated to change, you know, this this block number three. However, democracy rules, right? The majority rules in the blockchain. Peer B and peer C both say, hey, you know, that, that's cute and all, peer A, but you're wrong, right? That, that's not right. Now, it might be a little abstract that you just look at data and, you know, us typing kind of random stuff in here and think, okay, yeah, that's that's data, right? That makes sense. You know, it just kind of random strings in here doesn't really do anything for us. So if we actually go over to the token section here, this is where everything really starts to make a lot of sense. So we have the exact same setup here uh, with peer A, peer B, peer C, except the difference is instead of having kind of this, this data section, we have this uh, TX, this transaction section, right? And this represents all the transactions that are happening in this block, right? So we're, we're sending $25 from Darcy to Bingle or to Bingley uh, for uh, $4.27 here, uh, 1922, right? And it's the exact same thing. So this, all these transactions are going to get hashed in the exact same way uh, that the data is going to get hashed. And, and this is why it's so powerful. Because again, you know, if I want to be malicious, right? If, uh, if I want to say, hey, I, I really wanted to give Jane a lot more money from Elizabeth. So I'm pure A. And I go back and I change it to 100. Well, now, you know, not only do I does my whole blockchain uh, get invalidated because that was so far uh, so long ago, but I'm not going to match any of these other chains, right? And so my blockchain is going to be excluded from the overall blockchain. So and let's let's go ahead and fix this. And it's the same thing. If down here, if I, I become malicious and I want to send, you know, I want uh, Miss Audrey to have less money, maybe I want to send a dollar, and I go ahead and mine it. The same thing here. This hash now, this 2A1, is not going to match peer B's, peer B's hash of BBA, and it's not going to match peer C's hash of BBA as well. So the two of them are going to say, hey, this, your blockchain is invalid, it's not matching the majority, you know, you're out, right? So that's really how uh, these blockchains work, 
at a low level. And it all goes back to this, this understanding this hash idea and using it in this very sophisticated manner uh, to kind of cryptographically prove um, you know, where, where stuff lies. Now, the way the blockchain works is that instead of random stuff put in this data section, it's actually gonna be solidity code in here, defining ways to interact with different blocks and different protocols that are on chain. Or, as we've said before, different smart contracts. Now, the next question that you might be asking is, okay, well, how do I know, how can I be sure that I'm the one, uh, you know, let's say this is, let's say I'm Darcy, right? How can I be sure that I was, that Darcy was the one to actually send this money here? How do we know that Darcy sent $25 to uh, Bingley? Well, this is where we get into uh, private keys and public keys, and that's what we're going to go into now. Let's just do a quick recap of what we've learned in this section so far, right? We've learned that Ethereum actually runs on this Ketchak 256, but you know we used SHA-256 for this demo. It doesn't really matter. We're just talking about hashing algorithms. So again, a hash is a unique fixed length string meant to identify any piece of data. A hash algorithm or a hash function is a function or algorithm that computes any type of data into a unique hash. Mining is gonna be the process of finding the solution to the blockchain problem. In our example, the problem was finding a hash that starts with four zeros. Nodes get paid for mining different blocks, and the problem is gonna be different blockchain to blockchain. A block in a blockchain is basically a combination of a block, nonce, transaction, and a previous hash to create this unique hash for this block. And again, depending on the blockchain implementation, this might have a couple other fields or might have different fields, but this is essentially what's going on. Blockchains are decentralized and distributed because many independent users are going to run this blockchain software and they will check and they will compare against each other to see which blockchains are acting honestly and which ones are acting maliciously. In the blockchain world, majority rules. The nonce here is the answer used or the number used to get this hash. Now, nonce is kind of an overloaded term. It's actually used for a number of different reasons. In this case, we're using it to solve this problem of getting you know, four or five zeros at the stop of the hash. However, in Ethereum, it'll also be often used as the number of transactions from a given address.